people are pitching tents and getting ready. Uh, this is uh, the third week consecutively that we are sleeping on the Boston Common and refusing to sleep in our homes powered by dirty electricity. Last week we had over 80 people sleep over and we are expecting that number to increase. We are hoping that uh, the governor introduces and the legislature passes a bill that we've written uh, that will repower the state with 100% clean electricity uh, by 2020. We are gathered here today not far from where a ragtag group of patriots gathered over two centuries ago. Their idealism coupled with their patriotism led them to start a revolution that changed the status quo across the world. It's once again time to change the status quo. We stand with the same sense of idealism and patriotism that our forefathers did. We have been called here by science and the scientists, among them James Hansen, who's joining us today. There are steps that we could take that would solve the problem, but legislatures are not yet doing that. They're doing things that the special interests uh, dictate. We've got to, and young people have got to notice what's happening. And if that cap and trade scheme, which is the heart of it, is actually then passed and then goes on to Copenhagen, it would be a disaster. It would lock us into 20 years of business as usual. Very small changes in emissions. We have a large task in front of us, but we also have a strong vision. We have a vision of a sustainable future where we live in harmony and not fear. The science has spoken. We need 100% clean energy in the next 10 years in this progressive state to send a message across the world. And just like the forefathers of this great nation, we'll sleep out and we won't stand down. That generation of, of patriots that Alex spoke of, uh, the crime that they were guilty of was treason and it was punishable by death. Uh, the crime we tonight here are guilty of is trespassing. And we need to remember every day when we wake up that the most important thing that we can be doing is saving the future. Representative Brownsberger is the vice chair of the House uh, Climate, Global Warming and Climate Change Committee, and he represents the 24th Middlesex District. So that's the challenge for you and for me and for everybody else who cares about climate change is to rise above the din of these problems that have perhaps a more immediate impact and to hold on to the vision of how serious the long-term consequences of climate change are going to be. But if we're going to have the, the influence that we want to have, what we have to do is find a way to make common cause with other issues. Now, why do we have a problem of climate change? No, because we are burning, 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 burning fossil fuels in all kinds of different forms for all kinds of different purposes. Conditions for civilization 350, there is no debating. 390 now and accelerating the science of science. The consequences of rapid climate change are a serious problem, and we're pushing for serious solutions. We're asking the Massachusetts legislator to pass a bill that starts a task force committed to getting us 100% clean electricity by 2020. And in his State of the Union address, President Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, put out what many thought was a, a, an overly ambitious challenge. He said that we as a nation should produce a total of 60,000 aircraft. Uh, in order to, to take on the dual threat of Nazi Germany and imperialist Japan. From 1942 until 1944, our nation came together, our women uh, came into the factories, our men went to war, and we produced a total of 216,600 aircraft. But if we lose the ice in the Himalayas, that, that collectively they provide water for over a billion people. Um, and they provide that water to the, the nuclear armed nations of China, India, and Pakistan. Uh, so if anyone has any idea where China and India and Pakistan can get water for irrigation and drinking for over a billion people, otherwise we are looking at, at a very, very destabilized world within our lifetime. Again, 2035, we could do, lose up to the, the, the water for, I believe, up to 400 million people, uh, some recent predictions estimate, by the year 2035. I think most of you plan on being alive then. I certainly do. Um, so th this, this is the type of world that we are looking to inherit if we do not take action rapidly. Uh, but we can take that same spirit that they used in World War II, 
to produce all those aircrafts, but instead use those to build wind, mill, wind turbines, to build solar panels. It's not going through. Is that better? Yeah. All right. Earth Day was also uh, one of those big three uh, in, the, in those days. Uh, I'm just an ordinary person, uh, but an idea occurred to me uh, about 20 years ago that uh, the community of faith needed to be involved in the environment, and uh, and now Interfaith Power and Light is active in over 30 states and uh, is growing nationally and internationally. Um, here in Massachusetts, we have Massachusetts Interfaith Power and Light. Please look it up. My great 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 grandfather was a was a Minute Man, and he. I uh, was a little late getting to uh, Lexington and Concord, but he led the troops at the Battle of Bunker Hill. William Prescott, his name was. I'm very proud of him, and, uh, and I wish I had the guts to do what he could do. Uh, it's a little different these days. Uh, we don't have the, uh, the British in Boston Harbor. Uh, the people we're looking at uh, are ourselves. Well, you know, I actually I have a really... Uh, okay, can you hear that? I, I have a really nice uh, uh, rally hat, but uh, I couldn't find it this morning. My reason for coming here is because I want to try to support young people uh, to try to make our leaders understand that the present course is incredibly unjust and inequitable for uh, young people and future generations. And more important, the Antarctic ice sheet which is much larger, and is, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet is much more vulnerable because it's sitting on bedrock below sea level, so it can get into the ocean very easily. It's now losing mass at a rate of about 150 cubic kilometers per year, and those rates are, are increasing. We're going to have to stabilize atmospheric carbon dioxide at a level no higher than about 350 parts per million. And we've already we've already increased it to 387 parts per million. Well, if you look at the fossil fuels and you see how much carbon there is in oil, gas, and coal, the problem is still solvable, just solvable, if we would phase out coal emissions over the next 20 years. And if we would then take some common sense steps like improved agricultural and forestry practices to draw down the CO2 in the atmosphere, as long as the fossil fuels are cheaper, somebody else will burn them. The only way that we can solve this problem is by putting a rising price on carbon emissions. Now, instead of accepting this message, which it has become very clear from the science and the economics, our governments are not, are not in fact taking actions or planning actions that will achieve this. If you look at what is being uh, proposed in the Senate and in the House and what's talked about in Cop for Copenhagen, which is a cap-and-trade scheme, you can prove that that is not going to work. We can see right now that it is not working. Look at, at the United States, for example. We have, our Secretary of State has just signed an agreement with Canada for a pipeline to carry oil from the tar sands in Canada to the United States. And I, by the way, when I mentioned we have to phase out coal, we also have to prohibit unconventional fossil fuels. That means tar shale, tar sands. There's so much carbon in those that there's, it's inconceivable to get back to 350. We cannot allow uh, those to happen. But in fact, what is actually happening in the United States, not only that pipeline, but also uh, coal plants, coal-fired power plants are still being built. I just had to come down and see these students because I think what they're doing is so fantastic. Uh, this is their future that's on the line with global warming. Uh, the world that they live in is going to be determined by what we do in the next few years. And to see them coming out here on the common and, and putting themselves here right at the seat of power and telling our incumbents what they have to do to save the climate is really uh, it's just inspiring to all of us.
Uh, next week, Bill McKibben is going to be leading a march from um, MIT, where the MCAN, Massachusetts Climate Action Network, is having a conference from MIT all the way to Boston Common, and he's sleeping out with us as well. Yeah. <laughs>